I, I hope it is clear to people that um, you, you're not obliged to be in any one IRSP, nor are you obliged to be in only one IRSP. It really is a matter of us negotiating and thinking where we would be best to place ourselves. Um, those who are leading the IRSPs don't think of themselves as only being involved in the IRSPs that they're leading. We're all involved in each of them at different levels and in different ways. So don't feel that the exercise is kind of putting you into a, a little, uh, you know, pigeonhole mailbox uh, slot. What we're doing is trying to clarify where we're going to find the research interests that will fill out uh, each of the IRSPs. And we're doing them as IRSPs just because the, the field is so large. We wanted to break it down into uh, areas that were... Uh, not kind of discrete and impermeable categories but, or silos, but rather ones that would give us a chance at least to focus our attention on uh, a series of cognate issues that do hold together in some important ways. But I invite you to be involved in uh, whichever one or ones you feel would be appropriate and to which you could make a uh, contribution. IRSP4, which uh, Ilya and I are the uh, co-leaders of, has to do with surveillance and population management. And uh, the tag on that is in conflict zones. And we wanted to look at um, surveillance in some specific contexts, as I said yesterday, ones that have not necessarily had the uh, systematic study within a surveillance studies kind of frame. So to look at population management in conflict zones, but then to say again, well, there are various places that we could look at around the world, in Latin America or South Africa or wherever, but let's look at Israel-Palestine. Here is a case in point that is both exemplary in the, not in the sense of being an example to follow necessarily, but um, it's, it gives us a fine example of what's actually going on. We can see what is happening in terms of uh, identification protocols and sorting, categorization, spatial distribution, uh, channeling through specific borders, checkpoints, and so on. It gives us a sense of what's actually going on and what can be achieved using a variety of uh, techniques, using surveillance to achieve population control ends. It has a, a secondary, uh, but I think equally important dimension to it, which is looking at the ways in which just those techniques can be and are exported elsewhere. Again, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, March 27th, um, Stockwell Day and Avi Dichter signed the partnership agreement on security and surveillance between Canada and Israel. That didn't come out of the blue. It arose from the meeting of, with, uh, of, of Stockwell Day in Israel back in, I think it was November. It was clearly in the pipeline for some time. And that wasn't the beginning of it either. It is almost a uh, copycat um, event to ones that have previously taken place between the United States and Israel. So there's a story here about the ways in which those population management uh, surveillance techniques are also seen as being exportable. And through the uh, international agreements that are being made between, in the case that we're looking at, Israel and other countries, we also see the impact and the, uh, what I think should be our research interest in, the consequences of that uh, exporting of those kinds of techniques. Now, our, Elia is going to explain the thing in more detail, but our uh, IRSP was the one that we felt we wanted to move forward with as uh, rapidly as possible. So ours is the first one to have uh, a research workshop that will take place in December this year. And so that means that whereas the others sort of will build towards the workshop in a very uh, strong way, ours is going to still be continuing after the workshop as well. So We've done a couple of things. One person who is uh, a collaborator has joined us in planning the research workshop, uh, Yasmin Abu Laban, and uh, she'll participate in this little section too. And also, we've uh, hired a postdoc at Queens, Vida Bites, and uh, she is going to, here she is, she is going to be uh, involved in that IRSP too.
So you'll hear about the workshop. I'll leave uh, Ilya and Yasmin to explain details of that. But think of it as part of a project that will actually be continuing after the workshop takes place in uh, December. Colleagues. <coughs> Since uh, we were way ahead of the game, ahead of the curve, as they say, and pla not planning for the workshop early on, um, so we, in a sense, uh, have so far the abstract for the workshop, the planning of the panel for the workshop, and in all likelihood, also the, the entire venue and the location of the workshop. But let me just say a couple of things about this particular workshop. If I look at the four walls here, I see that this is not as sexy as the others, conflict and security. Uh, that is left out. I hope that as time goes on, that we will have you also look at this, uh, uh, this theme in a more sort of uh, empathic way, not sympathetic, but empathic way. Because as Kevin pointed out, there is this relationship between, for example, non level and security, uh, globally, not only in the United States and Canada, but globally. Uh, so what is the focus of the workshop and what does it deal with? Um, I thought for a long time, and I will talk about this in the afternoon, that there was a missing element in surveillance studies. Uh, studies of conflict zones and third world in general. These studies were sort of almost absent. Uh, surely there is lots of literature on information technology and development in the third world. But that is not what, is, uh, what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how surveillance technologies are being globalized and used in third world context, uh, whether it's the United States or any other industrial uh, country. So, in specific terms, uh, we will be looking at, in, to begin with, and this is only the first phase of uh, uh, this workshop, there will be other phases, and as David mentioned, this is a case study which we hope in the future we will be able to replicate in the sense of looking at other conflict zones, other case studies, and do comparative analysis between the Israel, Palestine, and other conflict zones, uh, which will give us even uh, a more wider scope of what's going on. Now, uh, and I, I don't know how many of you have seen the call for papers, which it was circulated to the executive, and I think to everybody else it's available on our website. Uh, but what we hope to accomplish is the following. To study social sorting of population through discursive practices involving people counting and census construction. Somehow census construction is not, again, is not a sexy thing. Very few people deal with it. Uh, they don't talk about, they don't think of census as a method of surveillance, and it's very much so a method of surveillance in terms of categorization, sorting, and so on. And uh, uh, Bruce Curtis from Carlton has done an excellent book on the topic, not necessarily of surveillance, but census construction in Canada. And the thesis was just recently completed a PhD thesis comparing Canada and Israel in the, uh, from the perspective of census construction and the importance of, of looking at uh, the census as an organizing tool. Uh, the second theme is spatial control, urban warfare, and territorial sovereignty. Uh, these are, this is also will be a more general sort of concern. Geographic mobility, use of technology in its various forms to manage people and violence in conflict situations. Discourses of state securitization, biopolitics, securitization, and surveillance, as I see it, are the key elements of this. And Yasmin, in a second, will talk about this and the whole debate over Agamben's work uh, regarding biopolitics. So, uh, the extent to which also these technologies are being exported. Uh, uh, globally is also important for us. Uh, now, I'm going to stop here and turn it over to Yasmin, but let's just say a couple of things. We are doing 
a project at the present time, not I myself, but we have contracted it out from the previous funds to do analysis will be relevant to the two of you, to your workshop, to look at high-tech technology in Israel and interviews with CEOs in high-tech companies in Israel, and there are about, about 350 or 500 high-tech companies. Israel is a major player in the production and marketing of surveillance technologies. And the interviews, the results are coming in. I think in the afternoon I'll pull one quotation and show it to you uh, from a CIO uh, of one of those companies who says he intends or, or he had a client who intends to turn cities into military bases. How so? By putting cameras but pe and other surveillance technologies in such a way that people will not feel them, will not recognize them, will not see them. So we'll have some sort of in invisible surveillance technologies turning <laughs> urban centers into uh, 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 into something akin to military bases. So um, there is a lot of work in this area, and we don't see in this project, at least at the outset, we were captured by the Western experience of surveillance. I would like to just small push to move it to another, uh, to, to expand it. And finally, uh, there was a reference earlier on that the internet was not or has not been surveyed uh, uh, extensively or uh, to the extent that it deserves. Let me just draw your attention that a PhD thesis from here that David and I supervise is coming out in a book now, or came out actually in a book a month ago. The author is Stephen Marmora, uh, who will be moving on to Maritimes to, to, to take a job, and the title of the book is Hegemony in the Digital Age, the Arab-Israeli Conflict Online. And what he did, he did analysis of fundamentalist groups, Christians, Muslims and uh, Jewish fundamentalist groups and their use of the internet in order to convey their messages. So it was part of an analysis of cyber war. <coughs> so I urge you, if you would like to, to get the full citation, I could give it to you. Now, I'm going to turn this over to Yasmin to give you just a flavor of what the workshop has sort of uh, uh, in store for, for, for those who are participating. So over to you, Yasmin. Um, well, there was a reference to Mark Twain's classic, and it's been some years since I read it, and I can't remember if Huckleberry Finn was kind of stupid. I don't exactly remember the book, but let me just say there's obviously a lot of room for um, individuals who might want to paint um, in this MCRI because um, I started, I'm, I'm a collaborator in, in, in the MCRI project and have kind of gotten involved in this workshop via uh, having never worked with uh, either Aaliyah or David but through, you know, kind of um, just the, the contact we had in the, in the context of putting the MCRI uh, proposal together. So um, in terms of the um, workshop, um, this uh, just, and I, I flag this because I know there's going to be other workshops developing um, in the coming years. Um, this was a bit of a hybrid in terms of involving uh, a specific call to papers to people involved in the MSRI, but also um, a more general call um, for papers. And uh, we received a number of abstracts, um, uh, something in the neighbor of, neighborhood of 48 right now, but the, it keeps increasing. And in fact, I just looked at my email this morning. There was another um, submission, although we've already made um, our lists um, for, for the conference. So it's increasing. Um, we um, accepted about 30 uh, proposals. So there was a rejection rate of close to 40%. Um, uh, and obviously, that rejection rate is kind of increasing as we get uh, more things coming in. Um, in terms of the um, demographics of the participants in this upcoming workshop, um, we were paying attention to a number of um, issues. So close to two-thirds of the um, people that are participating are uh, tenure track or tenured faculty. I mean, obviously a number involved in the MCRI project, but uh, others as well. And then about a third postdocs and, and graduate students. Um, one of the great things about working with Aaliyah and David, and I say this coming from a discipline that's been uh, kind of historically underrepresented by women, is that they think about uh, issues of gender uh, representation. Uh, so there's about a third uh, women uh participating in this uh, workshop. The feminist in me wants to have 51.5% at least or more. But, um, uh, the, you know, this is, I think, if you think, of, when I think of my discipline as sort of security, the security area, I mean, having one third women is, is actually a very good um, outcome um, uh, given the kind of kind of area. So um, I guess that's something to uh, be aware of in surveillance studies too, the sort of gender um, uh, dynamics and, and uh, representation. 
Um, partially also because the kind of perspective people might bring in if they're doing feminist scholarship is it might be different than um, other kinds of scholarship. Um, the other thing we were paying attention to was like where people were coming from. So about two thirds of the participants in this workshop are coming from countries outside North America, um, and specifically countries of Europe and, and the Middle East, a number from um, a number of individuals from um, Israeli universities. So we were paying attention to this uh, because there was sort of this open question going into the workshop of uh, where was gonna be the most appropriate venue and um, uh, uh, the, this particular MCRI is very concerned with environmental issues and the carbon footprint and our collective sort of carbon footprint and also obviously in relation to cost. So uh, because of the large number coming from Middle East and um, European countries, um, it's looking like the location is going to be um, Cyprus. And then just briefly to give you kind of a sense of some of the um, uh, uh, proposals that we received and how it relates to some of the themes we've been talking about over the last couple of days. Um, a, a big theme that stands out in the MCRI, and David was talking about it yesterday, is this idea of like the past, the present, and the future, and what, what how surveillance has sort of um, occurred over time. Keeping in mind, I learned from the dean yesterday, your dean, that um, even chickadees surveil. So. <laughs> um, and so, um, so we have a number of participants that are looking at uh, surveillance in Israel-Palestine historically. So for example, the use of uh, informants just after the creation of the State of Israel in 1948, uh, as well as looking at surveillance practices contemporaneously. So for example, um, E.L. Weissman um, is uh, looking at the growth of uh, Israeli settlements in the occupied territories and the role played by settlers themselves in sort of surveilling the um, Palestinian uh, population. Stephen, Stephen uh, Graham, who's involved in this MCRI um, in, from Britain, uh, is looking at herbicide and the use of uh, the military in a uh, sort of civilian context. Uh, another theme of the MCRI um, relates to the political economy of surveillance. I had a good discussion with Christy yesterday about that. Um, and we have uh, participants addressing this theme. So uh, one stands out uh, for me uh, that uh, one, one of the proposals by Nev uh, Gordon, who is um, at uh, Ben Gurion University, and he's going to address the uh, sort of Israeli surveillance industry and how um, this industry has emerged globally as a uh, as having a kind of comparative advantage uh, because of the particular uh, conflict. Um, social sorting um, as developed by David Lyon and through this uh, MCRI is also a big theme in this workshop. So there's a number of participants looking at issues of racialization and surveillance and how inequality and disadvantage uh, sort of mark the lived experience of uh, Palestinians under occupation as well as um, Arab Israelis. And um, the floating theme I guess the next, the, in the second phase of the work uh, of the MCRI is around um, resistance to surveillance. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I mean, I think this is something people want to always be thinking about. And um, fortunately, it shows up in the in the proposals that we've gotten. And I think there's one uh, very interesting uh, uh, paper that that stood out for me that is looking at um, an Israeli NGO known uh, called Mashom Watch that. Uh, notably is comprised of women, Israeli women, uh, who monitor the behavior of Israeli soldiers at um, uh, checkpoints um, and kind of bear witness to um, what's happening and to, in, in the name of sort of protecting the human rights of, of Palestinians at checkpoints. Um, for those of you um, that don't know that conflict zone, um, Palestinians under occupation um, have not had free mobility and this you know, sort of predates the, um, you know, construction of, of the wall which emerged um, post September 11. Um, so um, this this kind of, th I think this is a very important area to be looking at. And for those that study borders um, outside of that context, I mean, we, we look a lot now at the Canada-US border or the uh, US-Mexico border. Um, there's many, you know, sort of parallels, but they're amplified in that context of um, occupation. And then finally, um, obviously the big theme of kind of looking at this um, as, a, as a comparative um, issue relates to conflict zones and, and, and their relevance to other kinds of global um, spaces. And um, that's, again, part of the rationale for this comparative work. So um, notably, some participants are looking at the um, internationalization or, or sort of possible export of Israeli uh, practices to Europe and North America and the implications of this. So uh, we have one very uh, interesting uh, paper that's going to be given by uh, Reg Whitaker, who's um, well-known political scientist, um, and he's um, looking at um, airports and uh, sort of passenger screening in, uh, uh, in Israel and the um, implications of these sort of techniques being 
um, exported to countries of Europe and countries of uh, North America. So that gives you some flavor um, of what that workshop's about, and I think um, as well, hopefully, um, a sense of how it ties into some of the larger questions and issues that have emerged over the uh, last couple of days. Thanks, Any questions? Sir?